Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here, and today I've got a super weird knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the CMB Made Knives Kawananagare, which I am 100% certain is not actually how you pronounce that. I'm so sorry. That is probably the only time during this review you're going to hear me attempt to say it. I'm going to refer to this as the knife for the rest of the time. Thank you so much to CMB Made Knives for sending this in. Thanks to my patrons for supporting me. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. Who is CMB Made Knives? Apparently they were established in 2010 according to their website. So they've been around for a bit. I just didn't know that they existed. Um, they also apparently offer OEM services. So initially I was trying to figure out, and by the way, they're located in China. Um, but I was trying to figure out like which Chinese OEM are they using? Apparently they're their own OEM. So that's interesting. Um, what's so weird about this? Well, um, the whole thing is very squiggly, right? It looks like the, you know, the knife that uh, Jafar uses at the beginning of um, <laughs> Aladdin, right? It has a Cree style blade or whatever. There's a, another traditional name for it, which I'm sure, you know, the, the knife world scholars will all let us know down in the description. Um, not the first time we've seen it. Cold Steel has a production fully knife and there's a, a few others. Um, still, a, I, I would say it's safe to say is a less than common, whoops, less than common um, blade shape. So we're going to talk about front flipping. Or, or top flipping because it's possible, but you also, there's a good um, chance that you'll throw the blade, which is not what you should be doing with this. This is more of a front flipper. It's a very interesting knife, but I think uh, right off the bat, I think it's safe to say, and very obvious to most people, this is um, a collector's item. This is knife enthusiast you know, sort of novelty thing. Does it, does it function? Does that mean that it's delicate and can't actually be used? Like the lock won't work and the blade isn't made out of, no, actually not at all. Um, the lock works very well. It's, you know, no more or less functional than any other frame lock. Um, it is manufactured to the same standards as all of the other premier Chinese, uh, production OEM knives that we've seen, right? Um, and they are using premium materials. So, yeah, it's functional, but it's um, a less convenient kind of functional, the type of inconvenience that only the most seasoned enthusiasts and collectors can dare to appreciate. <laughs> Stop giving us convenience. We want inconvenience. When we collect, we demand inconvenience. Well, CMB has delivered. Okay, let's go ahead. <laughs> Let's go ahead and uh, I know the Cree has, historically has its functions, right? Don't tell me, don't look up an article on Google and then try and lecture me. I know. Uh, I have access to the same articles. The overall length is coming in at seven and a quarter inches. Blade length is three and an eighth. Cutting edge is three inches. How about some size comparisons up against the Ontario Rat Model 1 and the Ontario Rat Model 2, it is definitely about the same overall size as the Rat 2. So it's 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 not a tiny knife, but it's on the smaller side. How about up against the Spyderco PM2 and the Spyderco Para 3? Again, closer to the size of the smaller one, almost exactly the same size as the Para 3. And then finally, how about the Benchmade Bugout and the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue? It is still small, small boy. Okay, how's the action? Actually, pretty good access to the lock bar. Fortunately, they did not sharpen it on both sides, which would have been a disaster. It is a front flipper, but it functions well as a front flipper. You can top flip it, but as I demonstrated, it's probably a bad idea because you have to really pinch it, and you're also kind of putting pressure. Um, a lot of times, I find myself accidentally putting pressure on that lock bar, so if you can you know, be cognizant of it, then it's a little easier to do. Um, but if you, I read a funny review on uh, Smoky Mountain, I think it was, no, it was White Mountain Knives. This guy was so agitated. Three stars. I had to break my finger to top flip it. You forget about it. It's actually pretty funny. You should go read it. Um, this dude was really, he, he definitely just, just, he woke up and was like, you know what? 
would be a great idea is if I just dumped hot sauce like directly into my pants and then ran a, a knife review. Um, no, it, it's absolutely um, able to be top flips, but it's a little bit of an awkward process and you really have to make sure that you've got your finger off of that lock bar. Outside of that, you are pretty much confined to front flipping it, which a lot of people, that's gonna be a turn off right there. Um, if you're gonna do a front flipper, it basically needs to be perfect. And this is pretty darn close. It'll work if you're used to front flipping, but if you're not used to it, you're probably going to throw it. That's just how it, you know, we've all thrown a front flipper. Don't pretend like you haven't. If you've handled a front flipper, you've thrown it at least once. Um, let's go ahead and, um, oh, and by the way, it does run on um, uh, bearings. Let's go ahead and do carry profile. Thickness up against the Spyderco Para 3. It's about the same, very close. Length and height up against the PM2 and Para 3. Um, it's a lot like carrying a titanium, a little fat little titanium caterpillar. Um, it, uh, you know, the carry profile isn't bad at all. It's just squiggly. It's kind of odd. Nowhere near as tall or long as either. Let's go ahead and do a hardware check. I'm going to get out my tools. As per usual, my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use on this channel. You can also find them in the, um, pinned comment. This is a T8. So we have a T8 pivot and do we have a T8 body screw? We do. We have one T8 body screw. That's nice. I imagine this is lipped in somehow. Uh, and then we have a hidden screw for the pocket clip, which is almost undoubtedly going to be a T6. So uh, simple disassembly process, nothing crazy there. That's good. Minimal hardware. I like that. Let's go ahead and weigh it. Materials, titanium. We got some uh, kind of blizzardy white and black carbon fiber. We also, you know, you have different options. You got like red and you got like blue carbon fiber and there's a bunch of other things. I mean, you all, the links down in the description will show you all the different versions. 2.54 ounces. Oh wait, what's the blade steel? S35VN. And I can't remember if they actually, cause I had to look it up. I don't think they actually have it printed anywhere. Um, but it is uh, S35VN. 2.57 ounces, so not heavy at all, and actually very good ratios. It's also balanced, yeah, a little butt heavy, honestly, but the thing is so compact. It's not a tiny knife in terms of length, but it's so compact, it's really hard to say that I noticed that imbalance. Uh, blade stock thickness, let's see if I can get a hold of the, uh, here, I, I do the front flipper there. Um, we are looking at 125, yeah, almost exactly. 122.5, 123 thousandths or so. Let's go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes here. What a weird looking thing. That's why I said yes to this because it's different, right? Not completely and totally unique. There are other knives out there. There are definitely other custom makers who have used the Cree blade shape, right? Um, there's even, like I said, there's even some production knives like the Cold Steel, whatever that thing is that uses the similar thing, right? Uh, probably effective at some kind of old, outdated style of knife fighting that is doesn't have any place in the modern world unless you're in the teeny, tiny, weird little echo chamber that those exist everywhere. So that's fine. I mean, I don't want to come down on anybody. If you're like, hey, listen, I represent the Cree. We're the the clan of the Cree blades and there we're, there may only be eight of us, but we take ourselves seriously. Well, hey, then you, that's fine, man. You just keep on keeping on. That's really okay. I mean, hey, I understand weird. I'm sitting in my basement talking into my phone about pocket knives endlessly. And I mean endlessly. So I have no room to talk. I don't think this is a practical blade shape. And I don't know that I really need to state that, but uh, you know, for whatever the original design, like the historical purpose of this blade shape is, whatever it is, the fact is, not my opinion, the fact is, is that the vast majority of people who pick this up, and I mean 99.9999999, repeat it as long as you want to, it's accurate, percent of people will simply use this to cut open packages that contain other knives or similar things like that. So when we're talking about how well it slices into something like paper, it'll do it. Yeah. Same with cardboard, right? In fact, that little, that little hook thing right there, right at the end, um, that actually is pretty good at just like digging directly into something and it, and it works, right? But the curvature, it just doesn't, it's not a convenient geometry for 
normal modern knife tasks. So hypothetically and theoretically, it's probably really good at something that has to do with combat, but it's just not applicable. <laughs> It's just like the 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 odds of someone using it, like the, the odds are, in, it's overwhelming, the the percentage of people who won't use it for whatever the blade shape was originally meant to be used for. And it's not like the designer doesn't understand that. No, they were like, hey, no one, I guarantee you, this is how this knife came about. No one's really doing this blade shape. That I bet that would get some attention. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's cool. I, I'm glad that this exists. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. You just don't see it, right? I don't know that there has ever been a titanium frame lock front flipper Cree folding knife. This might be the first one, which makes it interesting. So, yeah. Ergonomically, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's like, it's, it's a lot like holding on to a, a pe like a metal turd. Um, it, it I mean, that's, what it feels like. Um, the lines don't really, like, kind of, like, I, I feel like there was a, they just kept doing the squiggly, they just kept falling. I'm not sure that there was an ergonomic, like, any specific ergonomic positioning in mind when it came to your fingers. So, I mean, the edges are knocked down enough, right? But it's not an ergonomically comfortable thing. Um, the finish on this blade is sort of a concrete tumbling. Same with the frame. The inlay work is really nice. In fact, um, whoever, you know, I didn't know CMB did OEM work. But aside from one little thing, um, or one or two little things, I think the OEM work is pretty good. I mean, it feels a lot like what I'd expect from Wii Knives. Um, I mean, had had I found out that Wii Knives manufactured this, it wouldn't have surprised me at all. But apparently that's not the case. So, yeah, uh, the transition from titanium to inlay material, which, again, is carbon fiber, is, is good. Uh, the milling that they did on the pocket clip, the backspacer, and just the general seating of the hardware is also good. They also managed to get this squiggly fuller right up the middle or what would be the middle of the blade, right, as it melted. And then that final... You know, area right here that comes all the way out just about perfectly on both sides out to the tip. There's a teeny tiny little thin, little microscopically thin area on the top, right? Because as it's it's curving out towards the blade. But they did good. The cutting bevel is also somehow even uh, all the way down until we get just right to here. And it's really only ugly on this side. This was the only area where they were just like, blah, you know? But, I, I mean... It's kind of like the Max Ace Dragon. They still managed to do this, right? And don't tell me Cold Steel did it right. I've seen theirs. Those are all sorts of goofy. Those are crazy. It's like they it's like they made that someone tried to make that blade in an earthquake. It's nowhere near that like it's fine that they did it. I'm not I'm not complaining or anything, but I'm not I don't want to sit here and pretend like Cold Steel or whoever's done it before has done it better. This is hard to do, even if it's done by machine and maybe it's just touched up by hand at the end, right? Or they do, maybe they put the final cutting bevels on by hand or something. Maybe they do it by machine. I don't know. Either way, it's not an easy thing to do, right? Well, let's not even talk about sharpening. Let's say you're actually going to buy this and use it, right? I think most people will pick this up. It's just like, oh, it's weird and different. And that's fine. There's no, you don't, you don't need a reason. You don't have to force it into a roll in order to justify buying it. You can literally be like, that's cool. And I want to buy it. I mean, I do it all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you do, eventually you're going to have to sharpen it. And well, let me tell you, sharpening this thing looks like it would be an absolute nightmare. I don't care if you sharpen by hand, use a machine. Uh, this would be a mess. Um, so I would say pass on that. That really was not something that I would uh, enjoy doing. But, you know, they did a good job making this blade shape for sure. We have a little backspacer, no lanyard hole at all. Uh, then we have a milled pocket clip, which is following the theme. And it's also not a long clip. It also doesn't create a hot spot. I mean, honestly, the last thing I notice when I'm gripping this thing is the pocket clip. I'm main mainly noticing the fact that the thing is... It's very squiggly. Um, let's look on the inside here. It's checking for a lock bar insert. It does. It does have one. You can see it right in there. Steel lock bar insert that... Oh, it doubles as the over-travel stop, too. I just... I, I didn't realize. Okay. Nice. The stop pin is uh, internal, and it's actually attached to the blade. So these are individual stops that run on channels on either side of the titanium. So that's nice. 
No blade play up, down, left, or right. No lock stick, no pivot lash. The detent is appropriately tuned, fairly light for a front flipper. Now this guy's off center, which is a bummer because that's not like a, oh well, it's just a little, that's off center. Um, inexcusable if it cannot be quickly adjusted. I mean, you know, you can mess with the body screw. There's only one body screw, right? But these, uh, you know, this was sent directly by CMB. This should come centered. You know what? I bet I just pulled it back. I did. I pulled it back. The pivot just came loose a little bit. That's unacceptable. The pivot shouldn't come loose. Yeah, what? Every knife ever. Don't tell me these guys don't exist. Don't try to tell me I'm making up arguments. Every knife ever, the pivot's going to come loose if you flip it over and over and over again, right? I would much rather they don't hardcore Loctite it from the factory so that when the knife inevitably comes off center and the pivot gets loose, I can adjust it with some blue 242. Uh, then you can get it the way that you want, right? And then it will last a really, really long time until you need to do it again. There doesn't exist a knife that won't, you know, back it. We live in a finite universe where the, the, the laws of everything are constantly trying to pull everything apart. Now, nothing is in invincible over time. Things don't stay exactly the same way. It's just not how reality works. So I don't have a problem with that as long as I can adjust it. So never mind. The centering is good. Seriously, the only manufacturing issue with this whole thing is just that weird little area back there. But can I really get mad about that? Look at the blade. This is weird. S35EN titanium, some pretty cool carbon fiber, some really impressive machining. Not a huge knife. Runs on bearings. Uh, very unique, you know, in the, the grand scheme of just knife designs in general. Um, they want 200 bucks for it. At least that's how it was priced on White Mountain Knives when it was available. If you go to their website, it says MSRP is $235. Um, I, it blows my mind that people don't know this, but guys, MSRP is not the price that you see when it hits retailers. That's manufacturer suggested retail price. Uh, or, it's synonymous with the price that you should never pay. Um, that's the price that you see when you go to buy a vehicle and you look at brand new vehicles and it says the MSRP and then it's some wild number. Uh, you don't pay that price. At least you don't pay that price if you know how buying a car works. Um, but that's never the price that you pay. You pay the street price, right? Or when it hits retailers, um, they mark it down and make it look a little bit more enticing. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to say the price on this is $200. Don't, don't look at the MSRP and think, eh, it's not, not that much higher, right? But it's, it, this is a $200 knife. Do I think it's worth that? I don't know. It's pretty, honestly, it's pretty impressive. I, I don't have a problem with S35 Vienna. That's still super steel. It's still steel that I, I accept at this price point. It's made in China. Um, but a little bit more that goes into it than I think uh, a standard, you know, regular like a drop point blade. I think there's a little more work that goes into the blade. Pretty competitively priced, honestly. I would like to. I would like them to do a larger one. Uh, I would. I would like them to do this. Um, I think a lot of people would really enjoy them doing like an eight and a quarter inch version of this or eight and a half inch version of this because this is pretty small. Um, I think I would um, honestly be tempted to pick one up just as a collector if they made a bigger one. So if you don't mind smaller knives, you know, and you want something weird and fun and almost novelty that can still function if you really want to care, if you're just feeling kind of, you know, you're just feeling kind of sassy that day. Uh, then yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think this is for you. For ev literally everybody else, no, it's not practical. I mean, it's kind of a, a little bit of a pain to manipulate. And other than that, it's just like a high quality weird item. Uh, but interesting for sure. And I'm glad that it exists because again, otherwise the world would just be full of Civivi Elementums and Ontario Rap Model 2s. And we're, yeah, that's fine. We have a lot of really practical designs. It's fun to see things that are interesting every now and then. So that's going to be pretty much it today. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that metal complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.